The American Rivals of Sherlock Holmes, Section 15, by Charles Felton Pigeon. The Affair of Lamson's Cook Quincy sauntered slowly along the street, enjoying the sunny warmth of an early June morning. Few cases had been presented to him of late, and the resulting inactivity had served to stock him, both mentally and physically, with unusual energy. His keen eyes, restless with inaction, flashed hither and thither over the small throng of hurrying pedestrians, as though in search of something on which to exercise his peculiar talents. But the people surrounding him seemed productive of anything other than mysteries. They comprised mainly the usual throng of hurrying clerks, stenographers, and other employees, all rushing toward their individual desks or stations and whatever secrets might be buried in their minds were for the present, at least, successfully forgotten or covered. With a deep sigh at the possibility of another day of quiet and solitude, Quincy turned slowly in the direction of his own office, but he paused sharply as the sound of a call reached his ears. Zoya! Oh, I say Zoya! came the half-suppressed shout, and Quincy's eyes, flashing sharply over the street, instantly picked out the source of the call. Slowly bearing down on him, through the press of market wagons, trucks, and other early morning vehicles, came a handsome touring car. At the wheel sat an impassive French chauffeur, and in the tonneau, a fat, puffy little man danced frantically about for all the world like a huge bullfrog in a net. Quincy recognized the man as Herbert Lamson, prominent clubman, first-nighter, and society leader in general, and wondered vaguely what unseemly occurrence could have brought Lamson out at that early hour of the morning. He halted and stood smiling interrogatively as the machine drew up at the curb. Oh, I say, Sawyer, Lamson puffed, as soon as the car had been brought to a halt. It's lucky I found you, you know. I want you to come out to my house without a moment's delay. We've had a frightful occurrence there. Frightful! Which house? Quincy inquired, ignoring the door which Lamson held invitingly open. My country house, Sawyer. The one at Beverly. Come right away, won't you? It's an awful thing, and I simply must have help. But what is it? What has happened? Quincy questioned, not relishing the idea of being dragged down to Beverly to discover who had thrown a pebble through one of Lamson's plate-glass windows, which possibility, knowing Lamson as well as he did, Quincy deemed not improbable. "'It's murder, Sawyer,' Lamson spluttered, spitting out the word as though it choked him, and gazing helplessly at Quincy through his round, sheep-like eyes." Somebody brutally murdered my cook last night, and she could cook the best fish dinners I've ever tasted. Quincy barely suppressed a desire to laugh at the incongruity of the two statements, knowing well that the only method of endearing oneself to Lamson was through the medium of the latter's digestive system. For a moment only he hesitated, then swinging into the car beside Lamson, he settled back for the ride to Beverly. Now, Lamson, he said, when the car had drawn away from the mid-city tumult, give me some of the details of this case, so that I may be prepared to act when we arrive. Just when, so far as you can tell, did the murder take place? I can't say just when, Lamson informed him. I was away from the house from five o'clock in the afternoon until late last night. It might have been done while I was away or after I returned, because she was not discovered until early this morning. One of the maids, according to custom, went to call her in time to prepare breakfast and found her dead. I was immediately notified, and not knowing what else to do, I hurried up after you. I'll catch that murderer, Sawyer, if it costs me my entire fortune, he broke off savagely. That woman was a downright shrew. But she could cook. Lord bless you, she could cook. And now I must spend a year or two hunting another cook 
and I shall probably be obliged to live on all manner of horrible dishes during my search. I know I can never find another who will be able to cook fish the way she could. He seemed saddened, almost to the point of breaking down at the last thought. I understand, Lamson, said Quincy, after a protracted coughing fit behind his hand. But I want to get to the facts of the case itself, the murder. How was she murdered, and do you suspect anybody? Now give me something of that sort to work on. First, what was her name? Where did she come from, and how long has she been with you? Her name, said Lamson in a saddened voice, apparently engendered by the thought of the fish dinners which were to be his no more, was Mrs. Elizabeth Buck. She had been with me as a cook for about twelve years, but I have no idea where she came from originally. You see, I was obliged to hire her rather hastily at a time when I was given a dinner, and my other cook— Yes, yes, Quincy hurriedly interrupted. But had she any relatives or friends who wrote to her, or with whom she visited? Nobody of whom I've ever heard. In fact, from the time I first engaged her, I do not believe she has been away from my house a single day. Her sharp temper would rather preclude the possibility of her having any friends. And I doubt if there was a person in the world, outside myself, in whom she felt the slightest interest. Now, said Quincy approvingly, you are started right. Give me all the details you can up to the time when the body was discovered. Well, she was a woman who... As I said, apparently had neither friends nor acquaintances. Therefore, I do not think that the affair occurred because of some old grudge a previous associate may have owed her. Since I have been talking with you, a possibility, which hitherto had not occurred to me, has come into my mind. I paid her well, very well. And as I never knew of her spending much money at a time, she must have been able to lay by quite a bit in the past twelve years. Of course, she may have kept her money in a savings bank, but it is equally possible that her distrustful nature led her to hide it somewhere about her house. She did not room in my house, but in a little cottage which stood on the grounds living by herself. Now the possibility I mentioned, and which at the time when I left had not been investigated, is that somebody may have murdered her for money. Damn em. I'd have given them an equal amount gladly if they'd only let her live to cook for me. In person, she was a small woman of perhaps fifty, although she was so wizened and dried up by nature that she might have been either more or less. In fact, her appearance has never changed since I have known her. She was very small in stature, and although I think she would have been capable of putting up a stiff fight— she would have been no match, of course, for an ordinarily strong man. Last night, the servants say she retired to her cottage at her usual time, and nothing was heard of her during the evening. Very early this morning, one of the maids went to call her, and, receiving no response to her knock, pushed open the door and found the body. The woman had been stabbed, and the place was in a terrible state of disorder— but that part of it you can see for yourself when we get there. I left orders that nobody should enter the building and that nothing was to be disturbed until I returned. On making the discovery, the maid rushed from the house screaming and fell on the lawn in a dead faint. I was at once called, and by the time the maid had regained her senses, I was on the spot. As soon as she told her story, I looked hastily into the woman's house to verify the facts and hurried to Boston to secure your services. You are, of course, to do whatever you think best in the matter, and I give you full authority to act in any way you deem necessary on my premises. For a few moments, following the recital, Quincy was silent knowing well that little further information was to be gained until he should arrive at the grounds and be able to examine the premises in person. How did you employ the woman when you had absolutely no knowledge of her, 
or of her previous state of life? He asked, after a time. Why, I told you that I was obliged to have a cook in great haste at that time, Lamson protested. She was well recommended as a cook by the employment agency, and consequently I hired her with very little question. I have never had any trouble whatever with her, and in the twelve years I come to look on her as being scrupulously honest and trustworthy in every way. But wait, we are nearly there now, and you will soon have an opportunity to judge this matter at first hand. Quincy stared unseeingly at the low and dirty wooden buildings which lined the street along which the machine was speeding. The case appealed strongly to him as it had been rehearsed, and he could not suppress a certain intangible feeling that it would grow yet more interesting as it progressed. Of course, he considered, in case of murder for the purpose of robbery, at the possibility of which Lamson hinted, the case would undoubtedly degenerate into a mere police routine affair in which he could take no part. But on the other hand, the very air of mystery which appeared to surround the woman herself gave a vague promise of possibilities into which he would be able to dig and search to his heart's content. He glanced once more at his surroundings and discovered that they were now in more open country and that the dirty little buildings had given place to the more imposing residences of Beverly's summer colony. The machine turned abruptly, and he discovered that they were rolling up a curved driveway to what was undoubtedly Lamson's house. A much agitated servant hurried up to the machine as they alighted, and after a somewhat doubtful glance at Quincy, reported in a rapid undertone. The police are here, sir, and the medical examiner. I told them of my orders against allowing anybody to enter that cook's house until you had returned with a detective, and they consented to wait. They are down under the tree by the house now. All right, Higgins, Lamson replied, turning once more to Quincy. Now, Mr. Sawyer, if you will come right down, we can examine the rooms together. I am somewhat surprised that the police consented to await my return. They are usually little inclined to await the convenience of a private detective, are they not? Unfortunately, they are, Quincy replied with a dry smile. The police in a large city would not have done so, under any circumstances, but it is probable that in these smaller towns, the police and all other municipal officials are ready to pay heed to the wishes of their wealthy residents. It is out of respect to you, and through no regard for me, that they are waiting. Quincy carefully examined the exterior of the cook's former place of residence as they approached. It was a pretty little cottage, painted with a conservative white and standing in a location considerably removed from the residence of Lamson himself. The cottage was of fair dimensions, containing, he judged, about six rooms, but it appeared dwarfed because of the giant horse chestnut trees which towered above it on every side. From beneath one of these trees three men arose and came forward to meet them, Quincy having an excellent opportunity to examine the officials as they advanced. The foremost of the trio, he judged, by reason of the bountiful supply of gold braid sprinkled over his uniform, to be the chief of the local department. The second, who followed at a respectful distance, was evidently a member of the force, while the last, a rather small, dark-faced man in plain clothes, was undoubtedly the medical examiner. As Quincy and Lamson halted before the house, the chief bustled up to them, a smile, which was evidently intended to be courteous, playing across his ordinarily pompous features. "'We have been waiting for you for some time, Mr. Lamson,' he remarked. "'But under the circumstances we were willing to delay our work until your return. The affair undoubtedly will prove a simple one, and it is too bad that you have gone to the expense of importing a private detective. With the concluding words, he shot a brief but unfriendly glance in Quincy's direction. Lamson made no reply to the speech, other than by a brief nod of recognition, and stepping quickly to the door, he unlocked it and threw it open, standing aside to allow the entrance of the officials, like a pack of hounds unleashed, the local men dived through the door and into what was apparently a living room, Quincy and Lamson following in their rear. On entering the room, all paused abruptly and stared about them, the scene well warranting the sudden halt. 
The room was indeed in a terrible state of disorder. Furniture had been overturned, some had been broken, all had been misplaced, and on every hand were to be seen signs of violence and confusion. The main feature, however, was to be found in the figure of a little woman who lay almost in the very middle of the room. The body lay face down, the hair disheveled, and the clothing somewhat disarranged from the struggle, while from its side, and several inches below the left armpit, protruded the hilt of a heavy and strong-bladed knife. There were very few signs of blood, as the wound had evidently bled inwardly, but the scene was ghastly enough without that. Exercising the prerogative of his office, the medical examiner strode forward and knelt at the side of the body, gently turning it over. As he did so, the watchers instinctively started, for on the woman's face was revealed such an expression of fierce and malignant hatred as it is seldom the misfortune of any person to gaze on. The lips were drawn back in a snarl of rage, which left exposed the worn and ragged teeth, and the eyes, fixed and staring, seemed to hold in their depths a fury scarcely human. Lord, muttered Lamson, repressing a shudder, she surely didn't die with any love of man in her heart. The medical examiner grimly held up the knife. From here on, it's your work, gentlemen, he observed. Make what you can of this. The chief took the knife, and all stared curiously at it. It was an ordinary wooden-hilted knife, of the kind to be found in any market, and from the thinness of the blade, it had evidently known long service and many grindings. After nodding his head over it several times, the chief passed the knife on to Quincy, with the air of a man wishing to be courteous, although hardly recognizing the possibility of any value in the act. Judging from his expression, the knife meant much or nothing. He glanced at it keenly, turned it over several times, and then, without comment, returned it to the chief. The search for clues then started in earnest, the two members of the regular force burrowing amidst the debris in the room like terriers after a rat. They pulled open every drawer, peered under or through every article of furniture, and minutely examined every square inch of space in the room. Now and then the chief would pause to glance speculatively at Quincy, as though in fear that the private detective might stumble on a clue that the regulars had overlooked. After each scrutiny, however, he invariably returned to his search, appearing satisfied that Quincy's aimless wanderings would net him nothing of value in the way of clues. "'By the way, chief,' Quincy interrupted at length, "'may I inquire as to what it is you expect to find in this room?' The chief eyed him suspiciously before replying, "'Well, it's not customary to hand our suspicions to outsiders, but, as you are, in a way, one of us, I don't mind telling you. Of course, we are looking for possible clues which the murderer may have left behind, but primarily I want to discover whether or not the old woman's hoard of money is missing.' "'I see, chief. But unless we know which we do not, where the money was hidden, how are we to be able to tell whether or not it is gone?' We suspect, of course, but we do not know that there was money hidden in the house. It is hardly likely that the woman would have kept any quantity of it hidden away in a bureau drawer. It strikes me that if she had money to hide, she would have placed it in a more secret hiding place, under the floorboards, behind a stone in the cellar wall, or in some similar crevice. We might search a week and still not find the place." And even if we should chance to find the money, all we should have gained would be a knowledge that the murderer did not take it. Look over the room. There was no search for money previous to our coming. That furniture was all disarranged during the struggle. Either the murderer knew exactly where the money was hidden and took it from its hiding place, or else he was actuated by some other motive entirely and had neither thought nor regard for the money that might be here. The chief listened stolidly to Quincy's summing up of the matter, but he seemed unimpressed. <laughs> you are at liberty to follow any method you please in the conduct of your search, he said coldly. But the regular police must act under my orders, and I see no necessity for changing the orders because of your ingenious theory. I am experienced in these matters, Mr. Sawyer, 
and I judge that you are not. So please, don't confuse my men by advancing any other theories. This was murder for the purpose of robbery, and for no other purpose under the sun. Quincy meekly accepted the rebuff without reply, but there was a peculiar smile playing about his lips as he turned away. Apparently undisturbed, he wandered nonchalantly out of the room, with Lamson, angered at the treatment his special representative had received, trailing behind. To the remaining rooms on the first floor, Quincy paid only the most casual notice, doing little more to glance into each before ascending the stairs. On the second floor, however, his interest appeared to awaken, especially when the woman's chamber had been reached. Once within the chamber, his aimless wandering ceased, and his every movement appeared to take on a definite purpose. He glanced sharply over the walls, carefully scrutinizing the few pictures with which they were adorned, after which he stepped briskly to the bureau, where he conducted a most minute examination of the contents of every drawer. Once he paused and held up a small packet before the gaze of Lamson, grinning as he did so. "'I imagine our friends downstairs would be interested in this,' he remarked. "'What are they?' Lamson questioned eagerly. "'Bank books. Your late cook evidently patronized several savings banks instead of hoarding her money as has been suspected. I'll place them back where they were and let the police discover them when they reach this point in their search. At their present rate of speed, they should reach this room in a day or two. For some little time after the discovery of books, he remained before the bureau, searching every nook and cranny of it. At last appearing vastly dissatisfied with the result, he arose and stood meditatively in the middle of the room, allowing his eyes to run rapidly over first one article of furniture and then another. Did your cook have a trunk when she came here? He questioned abruptly. I don't think so, said Lamson slowly, as he strived to remember the event of twelve years previous. No, I am sure she brought with her one of those old-fashioned canvas extension bags. It must be around here somewhere. Quincy's interest appeared to renew itself at the information, and he was immediately deep in his search again. At last, with much shuffling and scuffling of his feet, he emerged backward from a dark nook in the closet, dragging after him the described bag. Placing it on the floor, he arose and stared at Lamson through eyes shining with eagerness. Lamson, he said, I expect to find the clue I want in that bag. There is one thing that no woman, and few men for that matter, regardless of station in life, is without in these days. It may be only the most tantalizing of clues, which I shall be able to make nothing of, but I'll stake my reputation that it's there. With no further explanation, he threw back the cover of the bag, dropped on his knees before it, and dug into its contents. For several moments there was no sound save his eager breathing, echoed by the puffing breaths of Lamson, and the swishing articles being hastily overturned in the bag. Then, with an almost explosive exhalation, he started back and sprang to his feet three small articles in his hand. "'I have it, Lamson!' he exclaimed. "'I have it! Now, what can we make of it?' He strode to the nearest window, with Lamson scuttling at his heels, and held up to the light three small unmounted photographs. "'You see, Lamson,' he said, "'every woman has a certain degree of sentiment in her makeup. Consequently, in these days of plentiful photographs, there is scarcely a woman anywhere who does not possess photographs of her early home or associations surrounding it. Here we have the photographs, but as they are not mounted and bear no photographer's seal, their value to us will depend on our ability to recognize the places represented. Lamson stared incredulously. But, my dear Sawyer, he protested, those photographs may represent scenes of hundreds or thousands of miles from here. How are we to recognize them? Quincy lowered the photographs and turned impressively. Lamson, he said, I have not yet looked at those photographs closely, but mark my words when I tell you that they will represent scenes within a radius of fifty miles. That woman was not a traveler. Without further comment, 
He raised the photographs once more and studied them carefully. The first depicted a woman, beyond doubt Mrs. Buck, at a period much earlier in her life, standing before a small cottage of the style of architecture most frequently seen among the houses of the ocean fishermen. The second showed a large open boat, a trawler, fully manned, and lying just below a wharf with the wharf's buildings visible in the background. The last showed two fishermen standing on the steps of a hotel and holding between them a strange monster of the deep, while above curious guests peered down from over the balcony rail. There, Lamson, I think we have our clue. But how? What in the deuce is there to all that stuff that shows you anything? Lamson was fairly staggered with bewilderment. Look here! Quincy flipped the second photograph into view. That trawler indicates, as do all three photographs, a fishing community. Now look at the buildings in the background. On the central building you can dimly distinguish the sign of a fishing company, the Bay State Codfish Company. Now look at this third photograph. Above the fishermen's heads is the sign of the Puritan Hotel. By coupling those two names, we have our clue. Both the Bay State Codfish Company and the Puritan Hotel are located in Gloucester. In the photograph of Mrs. Buck herself, we find her standing before a typical fisherman's cottage. Therefore, does our clue not point toward Gloucester as a starting point in our search for the woman's identity and that of her murderer? I also have another clue, but I shall leave that out of the matter for the present. Then you will go to Gloucester? Lamson questioned. At once although I would suggest that you do not mention the fact to the police. It might only serve to further muddle their brains, and they are sufficiently at sea in regard to this case already. You may use my car for the trip if you want to, Lamson volunteered immediately. No, thank you. I prefer to go in the train. I shall be pleased to have your car take me to the station, though, if that will not inconvenience you. As the pair descended the stairs, they paused a moment to gaze at the activities of the police. The room remained in much the same condition as when they had originally viewed it, except for the fact that the body had been removed, thus doing away with the most gruesome feature of the case. Seeing them, the chief paused for a moment. "'Giving up so early in the game, Mr. Sawyer?' he inquired, a slightly sneering accent in his voice. "'Not exactly giving up, chief.' Quincy replied, ignoring the tone. But my business temporarily calls me elsewhere, and for the present I shall be obliged to absent myself. I expect to return here later on, though, unless in the meantime you have been able to solve the mystery. You have found no trace of hidden wealth as yet, I suppose? No, we have found nothing, but there must be some clue to it somewhere. I am about to act on your suggestion and search the cellar. Before you do that, Chief, said Quincy, smiling frankly, I would suggest that you search the woman's chamber. There are some bank books there which will be of interest to you. You mean that her money was deposited in a bank? The Chief demanded sharply. It was, and still is, in a bank, or in banks, to be more exact. I fear you will be wasting your time if you search farther for it here. For a moment the chief stared silently, but at last a slow grin began to relieve the hard lines of his face. Mr. Sawyer, he said, you have put one across on us. I held you lightly in the beginning because, several times of late, my department has been considerably hindered by the actions of amateur detectives, and I took you to belong to the same class. I see you know your business, and I apologize for my former abruptness of speech. The speech came to a complete surprise to Quincy, but he was not to be outdone in courtesy. Chief, he said, I accept your remarks in the spirit in which they were intended. Frankly, I am now starting out on a clue which I think will prove valuable. If I am successful, I shall notify you of the fact on my return and it is highly probable that we may be able to act together in the final scenes. The chief regarded him with increased respect. I shall be pleased to act with you, <laughs> if you are successful, he said simply. In ten minutes, Quincy was seated in Lamson's car, 
and hurrying toward the railroad station. Shortly afterward, he was aboard a train for Gloucester, and bending over the three photographs, was carefully arranging his plans for the campaign he intended to wage in that peculiar city. All that day, and throughout the night, Lamson and the chief anxiously awaited the return of Quincy or the coming of some word which would indicate his progress. The affair by that time had been spread broadcast through the medium of the press, and the ground swarmed with reporters, to the disgust of Lamson, who cordially hated the notoriety which was thus being brought to his door. The second forenoon following the murder passed away without result in the desired direction, and Lamson, unused to the necessary tedium of a police investigation, and suffering from the strain involved, was at his wit's end, when Quincy suddenly reappeared as unostentatiously as he had departed. Lamson rushed eagerly from the house to greet him, the chief, no less eager, hurrying after, while the handful of reporters clustered around, listening intently for the first hint which might be incorporated in their several stories. Quincy waved them laughingly aside. Not yet, boys, he adjured them. I have a good story for you, and you shall have it very shortly, but I must first make my report to Mr. Lamson. Obediently, the reporters fell back, accepting his assurance without question. Lamson and the chief reached him simultaneously, and above the hurried hum of the reporters' voices rose Lamson's appeal. What luck, Sawyer! For heaven's sake, tell me the result quickly! Quincy took him soothingly by the arm. It settled, Lamson, he said quietly. But my investigation has had a most remarkable result, a most surprising result. Come into the house, and I'll tell you all about it. When they were seated in the library, or at least when the chief and Quincy were seated, Lamson being too nervous to do anything other than to fidget about the room, Quincy digressed slightly from the point of the matter in hand. I notice that you've gained considerable notoriety, Lamson, he said. Notoriety? Lamson snorted the word furiously. Notoriety? Yes, I certainly have, thanks to the press and its representatives outside. Look at the headlines which have been running. Wealthy Epicureans cook murdered, Lamson's Elysium wrecked by a murderer, and so on without end. Why in the world must I be dragged into the case in that manner? Quincy allowed himself a smile at Lamson's expense before proceeding. You are merely the victim of circumstances, Lamson. But that was not what I intended to tell you. I wish to warn you that you are to receive still more notoriety because this case is about to produce one of the greatest sensations the press has had for years. Lamson paled at the words, and his agitation increased perceptibly. You don't mean, he stammered, that you suspect me of the murder? Oh, no, Lamson. Great Scott, no, Quincy hastened to assure him. I have the murderer, and he has confessed. I merely wish to warn you that Mrs. Buck, regardless of her own identity, will still continue in the eyes of the public to be Lamson's cook, and as such she will be handled by the press. But sit down, man. Nobody suspects you. I'll tell you my story at once, so that your mind may be placed at rest in that direction at least. You know the photographs which I discovered before going to Gloucester? He inquired turning toward the chief. Yes, uh, Mr. Lamson told me of them, the chief informed him. Very well, then. I wished you to know of them before telling my story, because I desire you to be in possession of the several clues which led me to Gloucester. As you are aware, one of those pictures showed the wharf of the Bay State Codfish Company. Now, chief, remember, do you not recall that the knife with which the murder was committed was stamped on the hilt with the letters B.S.C. Company? From that fact, I argue that the person connected with the Bay State Codfish Company, in whom Mrs. Buck was interested years ago, must still be there, and that Gloucester was the spot which I must search for the murderer. As I said before, I found him, but in order to place you thoroughly in possession of the facts, I am going to retrogress twelve years and begin my story at that point. The discovery of the man after I reached Gloucester was a very simple act, so simple as to hardly be worthy of recognition in the story, while his confession followed almost as a matter of course. 
He is at present being held by the Gloucester police. I recognized him, Lamson, from the photograph. He is the man on the right of that sea monster in the third picture. He also appears in the second photograph, and, as the other does not, I naturally settled on him at once as the man whom I desired to find. But now for the story. Twelve years ago, Amos Buck and his shrewish wife, Elizabeth, your cook, Lamson, lived in a small cottage at the far end of the Gloucester waterfront. Amos was a trawler in the employ of the Bay State Codfish Company, and, being a steady, temperate man, was regarded by the heads of his department as being one of their most reliable employees. But in his case, as in that of every other man, his home environment played a great part in the matter of his value to his employers. His wife's shrewish nature developed, and her constant nagging eventually began to play its part in his ultimate downfall, the result being that he finally became a steady patron of the nearest groggery, and it appeared that his complete degeneration would be merely a matter of time. Daily indulgence soon became protracted into sprees of a week's duration, and Mrs. Buck became more vituperative than ever. Then another link in the peculiar chain of circumstances was forged. Amos brought to his home a widowed cousin, Emma Bray by name, and insisted upon her taking up her permanent residence with himself and his wife. Mrs. Bray greatly resembled Mrs. Buck in figure, although their features were vastly dissimilar, and their dispositions were as far separated as the poles. The cousin proved to be a pleasant, even-tempered woman, and she showed every desire to alleviate the constant friction between Buck and his wife. Her attempts at intervention only added to Mrs. Buck's fury, and within a few weeks Mrs. Buck had developed a hatred for both her husband and his cousin that was almost inhuman in its intensity. The demeanor of his wife at last had its effect on Buck himself, and, instead of meekly submitting to her verbal assaults as he had done in the past, he soon commenced to reply in kind, with the result that the house became a veritable inferno. This continued until one day Buck's temper, grown ragged from the constant warfare, gave way entirely, and he struck his wife, knocking her down. Then, overcome by the deed, and by the scenes which had led up to it, he rushed from the house to his favorite haunt in a cheap saloon. Although naturally a reticent man, his tongue soon became loosened by liquor, and when one of his associates pointed to a fresh cut on the side of Buck's head, inquiring as to its origin, he replied that his wife had made it, and that he had fixed her so she wouldn't do it again. The savage look with which he accompanied the words, and the dark hint which seemed to be contained in them, caused the speech to be remembered. Shortly afterward, Buck purchased a quart of raw rum and disappeared, going nobody knew where. The next morning, he was aroused by the chief of police from the drunken slumber into which he had sunk behind the sheltering piles of a lumber wharf. The rough handling by the chief, together with the black looks and muttered threats of the small body of men who accompanied him, completely sobered Buck, and he demanded the reason of his arrest. The reply was unsatisfactory, being merely a gruff, guess you know, from the chief, and a volley of threats from the crowd, which was constantly growing larger. To Buck's surprise, he was taken directly to his own house, and when led indoors, the last trace of liquor was driven out of him and his surprise was turned to horror. The main room of the cottage was indeed in a terrible state, its floor and walls being covered with blood, its meager furnishings broken and scattered, and its every appearance being as if a terrific battle had been waged within it. To make the nature of the crime which had been committed doubly sure, a blood-stained axe lay at one side of the room, where it had evidently been thrown by the fleeing murderer. But whatever hopes the chief may have had of securing a confession from Buck by taking him to the place were speedily dashed, for Buck, instead of breaking down, appeared too utterly stupefied by the scene for a speech of any kind. No trace of either woman had been found, and there was consequently nothing to do save to hold Buck on suspicion while the search for the bodies was being conducted. The search speedily bore fruit, for within an hour of Buck's arrest, the body of a woman was found floating in the harbor. The features had been obliterated, being so badly hacked and battered as to make recognition impossible, 
but the clothing on the body was speedily identified as being that of Mrs. Buck. As no trace of the cousin was found, it was decided that her body must have floated out to sea on the tide, and Buck was held, charged with the murder of both women. At the trial, circumstantial evidence figured strongly in securing Buck's conviction, but there was also a beautiful train of circumstantial evidence in his favor. He pointed out that no blood stains had been found on his clothing and defied the prosecution to demonstrate a way in which he could have hacked a body as his wife's had been mangled and then have it conveyed to the water without having become stained with blood. He also showed streaks of genius by defying the police to show conclusively that his cousin Emma Bray was really dead as no trace of her body had been found. This part of the indictment was shortly dropped and he stood accused of only the one murder, that of his wife. Of course, his rash words in the saloon played an important part against him, but in his favor was the absence of blood stains upon him, and the fact, together with his drunkenness and the well-known frequency with which his wife had assaulted him, both orally and physically, saved him from execution. He was, however, convicted of murder in the second degree, and sentenced to imprisonment for life. But even after Buck had been imprisoned, there remained many people who did not believe him guilty of the crime. Consequently, after he served a term of years, a movement was set on foot to have him pardoned, the movement being eventually successful. After his release, Buck returned to Gloucester and quietly resumed his old life, taking up his residence in his former home and again entering the employ of the Bay State Codfish Company. For two years he lived quietly, and then, like a sudden thunderclap, came a piece of news which entirely upset his every thought. An associate came to him, giving him positive assurance that he had seen Mrs. Buck in Beverly, and had been told that she was employed by a rich man as a cook. For days Buck brooded over that information, striving to make himself realize that he had not only been sent to prison for a crime which he had never committed, but also for one which, possibly, had never been committed at all. At last, he could stand the strain no longer, and so set out one night for Beverly, to prove himself the truth or falsity of the weird rumor. Before starting, moved by some instinct which even he himself cannot define, he secreted one of the company's knives in his coat, giving it no more thought after his departure from Gloucester. On his arrival in Beverly, he had no difficulty in locating Lamson's estate, and proceeding here at once, he slipped about in the darkness, searching for the woman who might or might not prove to be his wife. He soon stumbled on the cook's cottage, and peering through one of the lighted windows, he was able to clearly view the woman within, and his feelings cannot be described when he realized that she was indeed his wife. Overcome by a blind, insatiate fury, he made his way quickly to the front of the house, burst open the door, and confronted her. According to his story, the woman showed no surprise at seeing him, but merely sat staring into his face with a smile of contempt on her lips. She made no reply when he accused her of allowing him to be falsely imprisoned, but continued to gloat over him with an air that aroused his already uncontrollable fury to a pitch which it had never hitherto reached. He broke into a savage denunciation of her, and at last stung her into replying to his charges. To his intense surprise, she admitted them to be true. Not only that, but she boastfully asserted that she had killed his cousin out of revenge and had then dressed the body in her own clothes to throw suspicion on him, had dragged it into the water, and then fled from the place in disguise. As she warmed up to the recital, she added almost fiendish details, and through it all, she continued to glory in her own success and Buck's resulting conviction. Naturally, such a scene could have but one ending. Buck's temper became more and more savage, and at the conclusion of her story, he had reached a point but little, if anything, short of insanity. He told her he was going to kill her and that he would be justified in the act. The announcement sobered her and silenced her tongue. But, instead of screaming for help as he expected her to do, she launched herself fiercely at his throat. You know the result. The struggle was short-lived 
and at its conclusion, Buck hurried from the place, making his way immediately back to Gloucester, where I found him. Now, gentlemen. With the words, Quincy straightened impressively. Now we come to the sensational part of the whole affair. The question to be decided, and it is an important one, is, can Buck be punished for the murder? At first glance, the natural reply would be that he can, but can he? Can the courts touch him in any way? When a man is tried and acquitted, he cannot again be brought to trial for the same offense, even though it may afterward be shown conclusively that he is guilty. Therefore, can Buck be twice punished for the same offense? He has already paid the penalty, has paid in advance, so to speak, for the privilege of killing his wife. He was convicted when innocent, and now that he is guilty, can he be again convicted of the same crime for which he has already paid the penalty, which was legally demanded of him? I freely admit, gentlemen, that it is a question which I cannot answer, and you may rest assured that the press will eagerly await the decision of the Supreme Court if it is considered necessary to carry the matter that far. End of the Affair of Lamson's Cook by Charles